The movement of the stars and planets above us has always fascinated humans. And predicting the patterns of their movement is perhaps the first scientific study we ever attempted. Scientists have always tried to make useful predictions about our environment, whether that be the dance of the galaxies or the flicker of a candle flame. As chemists, we seek to explain what will happen when different substances are reacted together. And an understanding of the inner workings of the atom is fundamental to that aim. One key idea, Niels Bohr's model of the atom, borrowed from the ideas of the structure of our solar system in an attempt to explain the invisible world inside the atom. Join us as we look at this key idea that transformed our understanding of matter and led chemists ever closer to their goal of explaining how the universe works. Atoms, as we have already seen in a previous episode, have much of their mass concentrated in a tiny fraction of their total volume, that tiny, dense nucleus containing protons and neutrons, which sits at the centre of the atom while the electrons, those mysterious and elusive particles, spin around them. Quantum mechanics has taken us closer than ever before to predicting the possible locations of those electrons and the patterns of their orbits. But before quantum mechanics really got going, a Danish physicist named Niels Bohr proposed a model based upon the electrons orbiting the nucleus at fixed distances, rather like planets orbiting a star. Bohr published this model in 1913, only a couple of years after Rutherford had proposed the existence of the nucleus and his nuclear model of the atom. Bohr's model was our best version yet at explaining how an atom was constructed, and it lasted for over a decade until Erwin Schrödinger published his famous wave equation. Now, I suppose we have to answer a key question at this point. If Bohr's model was superseded by the quantum mechanics model, why are we learning about it now? The answer is actually pretty straightforward. Scientific models are not judged on whether they are true, whatever that means, but rather on whether they can accurately predict what will happen when we do certain things. And here, Bohr's model does an excellent job. So, even 120 years later, we still need to understand and use this model in our laboratories. So join me as I undertake a small challenge my goal is that 15 minutes from now, you will be able to use the periodic table to find Bohr's electron configuration of any of the first 20 elements of the periodic table. The real breakthrough of Bohr's model was to incorporate an idea from the developing concepts of quantum mechanics, that electrons could not exist at just any old distance from the nucleus, but that they sat at fixed distances from the atom's core. This makes it rather unlike planets orbiting a star, which could be virtually at any distance, and actually a lot more like this theme park ride. Bohr's model of the atom has fixed locations for the electrons to be placed into, rather like the seats on that fairground ride. Each orbital pathway around the nucleus only has a certain number of spaces or seats available. The closest orbit to the nucleus has only two spaces and the next two orbits only hold eight electrons each. And there we go. Just like one of Bohr's electrons orbiting the nucleus, here I sit in this seat in a fixed position around the centre of this ride, like an electron around the centre 
of the acid. And here we go, orbiting like an electron. In fact, the electrons have even fewer options available than I did. They must place themselves in the closest available location to the nucleus in the centre of the atom. And so the atom's electrons fill up those spaces in the shells from the inside outwards. And now for me, it's back to the office. So let's have a look at this model in more detail. Now, I'm no craftsman, as you'll be able to tell, but I've produced this little model of Bohr's atom. And you'll notice that the locations the electrons can occupy are fixed on this surface. The closest orbit to the nucleus has only two positions available. The second orbit holds eight, and so does the next one out. Now, before we go any further, let me just recap how we find the numbers of protons and electrons from the periodic table. Look up any element and notice those two numbers beside it. The smaller of the two numbers gives us the number of protons and of course the number of electrons always matches that number exactly. So let's construct an atom of helium. Now, we can see that helium has two protons and therefore will have two electrons. They must take the two closest positions to the nucleus and so they both sit in this innermost ring here. What about carbon? Well, it has six protons and therefore six electrons. We place two here and then the remaining four around this second orbit here. Finally, let's try aluminium. With 13 protons in the nucleus, we will need to place 13 electrons. That's two here, eight around here, And then the next three in the outside ring. Hopefully that's pretty straightforward so far. Now, we call these placements the electron configurations of the atoms. And we have a shorthand way of writing them down. We write the number of electrons in each orbit or shell, as we sometimes call them, and separate those values with a comma. So helium is just the number 2. Carbon is 2, 4, and aluminium will be 2, 8, 3. Bear with me while I switch to a slightly different board. I'll explain why in a moment. You can see that this is exactly the same hole pattern as before. The first shell holds two, the second eight, and the third eight as well. I've added a channel above to show the fourth shell. I had to use a channel as that shell holds a whopping 18 electrons. Now, let's do one more atom on this board. Pick, say, magnesium. Magnesium has 12 protons, and so I've got 12 electrons to place, remembering I must fill from the bottom shell up. So I'm going to place two electrons here, eight into this next shell, and then the final two electrons will need to take spaces in that third shell. Now, I'm just going to turn this grid around for you. And this pattern 
might start to look a little bit familiar. If not, have a look at the same thing here. Now this looks suspiciously similar to the arrangement of the elements in the periodic table. Let's just build magnesium again. So remember, 12 electrons in the configuration 2, 8, 2. And wouldn't you know it, but that final electron is in the same position as magnesium occupies in the periodic table. Let's try the same thing with carbon. So, that's two and four. And yep, it matches perfectly. Let's just do one more. Sulfur has 16 protons and 16 electrons. So, here we go. There's two here, eight here, and then that will leave six left over to go here, here, and here. And look at that. Another match up with sulfur's position in the periodic table. Of course, this isn't chance. In fact, the periodic table structure is intimately linked with the electron configuration of the atoms. So let's try this without my little board at all. What would be fluorine's electron configuration? Well, let's just count along through the periodic table. That's two, and then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So fluorine's electron configuration is two, comma, seven. What about nitrogen? Try this for yourself. Yep, that's two, then one, two, three, four, five. So its electron configuration is two, Five. Have a go with silicon. So silicon's electron configuration is two, eight, four. Now, there's an even easier shortcut at GCSE. Note that the columns, or groups as we call them, in the table have numbers at the top. Carbon is in group four. Nitrogen, 5, sulphur, 6, and fluorine, group 7. Note that this number tells us the number of electrons in that outermost shell. And that's it, really. You can now look at any element in the first three periods, remember that's what we chemists call rows, and give its electron configuration. What about the next period? Well, just count up how many elements there are in that period. So that's 18. Remember what I said about the next shell of electrons holding 18 electrons? So, yep, that link follows through all of the way through the whole table. Now, at GCSE in the UK, we're only interested in the first two elements in that period. That is potassium with the electron configuration 2, 8, 8, 1. And calcium, yeah, I suspect you were already ahead of me there. 2, 8, 8, 2. Oh, and just check the clock because we're done. In less than 15 minutes, you have learned how to work out Bohr's electron configuration for the first 20 elements in the periodic table. The Bohr model isn't the full picture, as I've already said. We now know that the electrons behave 
more like clouds of probability points than tiny planets in orbit. But Bohr gave us a start on that journey, a way to begin understanding the invisible world inside the atom. And for GCSE students, it's your first step on a journey into the quantum realm, where light and electrons can be both a particle and a wave, where matter is mostly empty space, and where the tiniest jumps of electrons in their orbits explain the glow of neon signs and the colour of candle flames. We'll see you next time to continue the journey.